give the stage to you. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Lorenzo. You can call me Waze because that's quite easier to pronounce for, I guess, many of you. I'm going to start to share my screen now so we can get started with the presentation. OK. So uh, we're going to talk about note taking for students. That means mainly how do you study in Obsidian and how do you use Obsidian as a study tool for university and for exams. Here's a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, firstly, I'm going to have some prerequisites for the rest of the talk, which are going to be about what I study and where I study. That's necessary to understand the type of exams I have to take and therefore how my study is organized and what my aim is. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some effective study principles. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it short. These are going to be just some pointers that are necessary to understand to uh, understand why and how I structure things. Next up, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk about why take notes, uh, given these effective study principles that I will have explained. Uh, next up, we're going to move on to planning. So we're going to talk on how I plan my study uh, and why I put note taking in the place it is. Why there's a moment for note taking in my study system. And next up, we're going to finally talk about actual note taking. We're going to jump into Obsidian and see how I actually take notes and how I organize them. Okay, so context. What I study, I do study medicine. Uh, that is a, a very mnemonic subject and it doesn't have exercises. I wanted to talk about this because uh, I'm guessing many um, other subjects like computer science or physics or math also involve like practice problems and stuff like that. That is something I don't have to do. Uh, so I think that that's needed to be taken into consideration when uh, you actually see how I study. So I don't prepare for uh, tests or exams like that. I just have to relay information. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't or you can't use Obsidian for that as well, just saying that my system is also based around that. Then where I study, I study in Italy. Here the system is heavily based on interrogation. So most of the exams we're gonna take are gonna be oral interrogation. That means that the professor is gonna ask one, maybe two or three questions, and then we are on our own and we're gonna have to talk about 20 to 30 minutes about something. Uh, therefore it's very, important for me to understand the concept rather than memorize specific facts. That means like uh, numbers or stuff like that are not going to be really important for me. It's going to be more important to understand the whole picture and a bunch of connection between stuff. Uh, that also means that I'm not going to use too much stuff like Anki because I'm not going to have to practice a uh, closed um, multiple test. It's mostly going to be uh, big discussions. Uh, and the other thing which kind of is a mix between the two things, so what and where, is that I will be following very little lessons and uh, I, will not take, I will not be taking a lot of lecture notes. Uh, I think this is important because one of the things many people think about when I say notes for university are gonna think about lecture notes. This is not some, something I'm gonna talk too much about here, uh, also because I mainly take this by hand because I think that the handwriting is better for uh, memorization while you're actually in the lecture. So this was just a little bit of context for you to understand what I do. Next up, we're going to talk about these two main uh, effective study principles, which I take into consideration when I go to plan my study and in general to quote unquote design my study method. Uh, this is spaced repetitions. I'm sure both of these concepts, most of you will be at least somewhat familiar with. Spaced repetitions uh, are um, a way to review uh, con content on a regular basis instead of cramming it all at the end, as you can see from this graph. The, the main point is you will, you will repeat stuff at increasingly uh, large uh, intervals of times. That therefore, the first repetition is going to be just like a day after you, you first see the material. Then it's going to be like two to three days, then a week, and then two weeks. This way, you'll be able to retain information for a long period of time. And um, at the same time, you won't have to cram them all at the end. And, and next up, we're going to talk about active recall. Active recall uh, is the method of actually recalling information from your mind before you review them. That means if you just study something, you're not just going to reread or highlight or stuff like that. You're going to actively try to answer questions about the, the things you're trying to, to, to remember. So this is very quick. I hope you, you understood what I said. If anybody has uh, some questions about this, we can just take them quickly now. But I would like not to focus on this too much. OK, I guess this was great. OK, so we're going to talk about why we take notes. Given what I just said, isn't it 
inefficient to take notes if uh, like if the main point is to space repetitions and to actually recall isn't taking notes something efficient well yes unfortunately taking notes is kind of inefficient but i do still take notes so why do i take notes the first thing is that notes forces you to re-elaborate the content you're learning. So you're actually forced to understand stuff because you need to write it in your own words. Um, therefore, it's very important for me to take notes because that's the best way I have to make sure that I actually comprehend the material. Next up, notes make it for easier repetitions. That means that you can actually uh, repeat without having to go look into the source material, which is usually very big and always kind of messy and cluttered. Instead, you're going to have a reference material that's very uh, custom to what you like and how you understand the, the material. Therefore, it makes it easier to uh, recall information in the future. And another reason, which is pretty much why I also use Obsidian, is future reference. So uh, if you take notes, you're going to have those notes forever in your life. And you're always going to have your sort of like little own custom Wikipedia. That's how I like to see it. So if I ever need to look for something in the future before I actually check the internet, I'm going to check my own notes. So uh, at the end of what you can imagine as a, a, per, as a six year of, of med school, I'm going to have quite a big amount of notes that I can always use in the future for a reference for even simple concepts. Um, so after this, we're going to talk about how to take effective notes. Because uh, if we said that notes are kind of inefficient, we're going to try to make them as efficient as possible. I would also like to uh, briefly touch on the concept that inefficiency is unavoidable like whatever system you're going to work with there's always going to be some inefficiency you cannot convert like a hundred percent of the energy in the work so sometimes it's important to uh, acknowledge that there, there are going to be inefficiency and try to quote unquote schedule them where they're most useful so in my case in my study method my inefficiency we can say is that i want to take notes and that has a certain amount of benefits but i acknowledge that it is somewhat inefficient okay and now we're going to move into planning. I'm sorry, but for now, my planning is in Notion. <laughs> I know we're going to talk about Obsidian later on, but I want to at least touch on this. Um, this is kind of important because this shows why I, I scheduled my study this way. OK, as you can see, this is just a calendar. And uh, the, all the, the entry year are the various chapters and subjects I actually have to study. I would also like you to keep in mind that I'll show you this in Notion, but I'm fairly sure that you can make this in Obsidian as well. Uh, using metadata and a bunch of plugins. Uh, I'm not really good with that stuff. At least I'm, I haven't learned yet, so I don't know exactly how, but I think you can replicate almost everything I'm going to show you. OK, so what I want to talk about mainly here in this part about my, my organization is uh, the three states every entry goes in. So just as an example, these were the things I had to do for today. And, and as you can see, there are. Uh, five states pretty much for anything you have i'm sorry most of this uh, most of this stuff is going to be written in italian so because that's the language i study in. so if anything is going to be kind of hard to understand don't worry about it you don't need to understand the the like the content of the notes just the the the, the concepts which i'm going to explain of course so as you can see we have a state properties that have has five states uh, the main thing you need to focus on are these three we have to read obsidian which means i'm going to have to take notes on that and to repeat which is the last one after i actually repeat them for the first time, I'm going to move them to repetitions, and then I'm going to count how many times I've repeated them, and I'm going to evaluate my knowledge of the of the subject with the terrible, bad, OK, you're good. The other two things which are kind of important is, is that I mark uh, the last time I review the subject and the, ne the next time I have to review it. Anything else is not really that important. So the main thing I would like you to uh, take away from this is the fact that I have three main states for each things I need to study. We have to read, which is the first step to read and comprehend the material and understand. The second step, which is going to be to take notes on it. And then the last part, which is to actually repeat and recall the subject. Um, the main other thing I would like you to, to see in this uh, presentation is the fact that usually in each day you have at least two things at the same time. So you have some things to study and some things to take notes on. This is very important because one thing I try to do is to take notes and actually study material at different times. What this means exactly is the fact that if I study something today, I'm going to take notes on it in maybe a week, something like that, not right after I study it. This uh, is very important in my system because it allows the note taking to be a sort of first step of space repetition. So the first time I take notes is also the first time I actually recall and review the material. Uh, so this allows to make the notes as efficient 
as possible because note taking is not only just uh, summarizing or uh, making a diagram of the material, but it's also the first time we can actually uh, repeat and try to recall the information. Okay, so uh, this should be everything about Notion. We can move back to my presentation. And now we can move on to actual note taking and to the Obsidian part of this talk. So in the Obsidian, we're gonna look at how we take effective notes. So once again, how do you structure your notes and how do you actually write them in a way that's as efficient as possible? How I organize my notes, so how I use indexes and stuff like that to have a great organization that facilitates the, the taking of the notes and then the reviewing of the notes. And finally, we're gonna have some uh, quality of life uh, things, so like plugins and themes and stuff I use to actually simply make my, my experience in Obsidian the, the, the best it can. Okay, if everything is fine, I'm gonna move to Obsidian. Any questions about this first like organizing part? Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Um, could you maybe quickly elaborate on, on your different stages and particularly on the distinction between the stage where, where, you, where you have stuff to read and stuff to, to put into Obsidian? Do you have these as separate stages where you sort of uh, tackle the thing separately? So do you first read things and then do you put it away and go back to it and then start taking notes on it? Yep, exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I do. So okay. as you can see, these are things I still have to read. What I'm going to do is actually take my book, read the things, underline and try to comprehend the material. And then mm -hmm. after I read it, let's say this is something I read today, I think. Yeah, this is something I read today. So now this is here currently, but I'm going to move it to somewhere like here right now. So. Mm -hmm. Today I read it for the first time and I'm gonna take notes on it in about two weeks. Mm, so the okay. first time I, when I take notes on this, I will probably not remember everything and I will use the note taking part of my process as an occasion for recall. So I'm gonna try to recall before I take notes and then I'm gonna take notes. Awesome, okay, interesting. Was that, was that clear? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great, we can move on. Okay, so I, I already had an overview of this. Okay, now we're gonna jump into Obsidian. This is what my actual vault looks like. This is my uh, the current exam I'm working on. Again, sorry, everything is gonna be in Italian, but please don't worry too much about that. You don't need to actually understand anything that's written here. And it's mostly like boring medical stuff. So no big deal. Okay. So this is what I actually see when I join my, my when I jump into my vault. But right now we're gonna just focus on this one page as a, as an example of my note taken. As you can see, a bunch of things immediately are clear to you. Uh, the first thing is that everything I write is in a, pretty much an outline form. So everything is a list, pretty much. Uh, I do this to force me to take notes that are more effective. But there's a reason for that. Uh, the main problem with taking notes is that often you end up summarizing information from your textbook or stuff like that. And summarizing is not really an efficient way to study. What's more efficient is to simply do diagrams. So for example, spider diagrams or uh, flow charts and stuff like that. What I'm trying to do with the outline is to transform my notes into a diagram. So pretty much you can conceptually think of this in like a spider diagram way. Is each title is like a sort of a big bubble, and then each item of the list is the first small bubbles that come up from the bigger one. And then each, everything under that is an even smaller one. So uh, the reason why I use outline is that, and uh, also it forces me to write less, which is another important point. Like my main goal is to write as the least word as possible, because what I'm trying to do is to have just the bare minimum that so that I can understand what I'm gonna talk about but not so much that notes are useless and I could just reference the original material. So ideally this would be like, I don't know, maybe one to two pages of textbooks that are condensed into some sort of like one page of Obsidian. So it's a very, very high condensed information that doesn't need to be referenced to the original material. So th that's the main like practical things. Other things I make great use of, which I really suggest you should do as well, is great use of errors, as you can see from, from these things. Like I usually, use errors as just another way to connect information, which once again, uh, is very easy to understand if you think about my spider diagram analogy. So this would be just another connection on that diagram. And another thing I use, uh, which you cannot really see here, uh, are symbols. 
So for example, if I'm just gonna jump right here, if I have to say that something increases, I'm just gonna use an arrow. If I have to say something decreases, I'm gonna use an arrow. If I have to say uh, some specific condition applies to males or females, I'm gonna use symbols like that. Something very, very simple, but allows you to cut down on the word count and your objective is to use the least word as possible. This is a way to do that. Okay, uh, in terms of actual like note taking, this was the main things I wanted to talk about. And other things is that uh, I use also Mermaid charts. Uh, I think I might find some of them here. Okay, you might find them, where is it? Probably at the end, somewhere. Uh, anyways, also, okay, there you go, I'm sorry for that. As you can see, uh, when I can, I try to use mermaid diagrams to explain um, stuff that's like more complex and that most importantly can easily be explained through a flowchart. Not everything can, but when things can, uh, I feel like it's a very good way to summarize material in a very, very condensed way. Okay, so now we're gonna get out of here. Okay. okay, so and another thing I wanted to try out always in this, like, uh, the main thing here is the concept of uh, condensing information. So another thing that like easily gets into that is the using of Excalidraw, which is a new plugin that just like came out recently, uh, which is, there you go, this one. Uh, I haven't really played with it too much, but as you can see, it allows you to draw an obsidian and that could be really useful to condense information even more. But we're gonna talk about plugins later. So this was just to, emphasize on the idea of condensing information. Uh, any question on this? I think this is a good place for question. Yes, indeed. Um, I think the most immediate question uh, is for, from Rose, who is asking how you can do this kind of charts in Obsidian that, we, that you just showed. I think it was a mermaid chart. Could you maybe yeah, quickly uh, show how this is done? Yep. I'm not very good at it, but I can try. <laughs> I mean, I, it usually takes me a lot of time as well. So <laughs> what you do is you insert a code block and then you write mermaid, I think, and then graph, you can decide the direction of the graph. Usually it's top, TD is top down, I think. And then you would say A connects to B. And if you go into preview, you can see A is linked to B. Anyways, uh, I don't know if you have a convenient link, but there's very good documentation on this online, and that's way better than anything I could explain. Uh, it's just a very quick way to insert uh, flowcharts into your notes. I think it's really it's really useful, as I said. Okay, thanks for linking the Mermaid Docs. Is this is this a core plugin, or do you need to install the plugin? Oh no, this is a core plugin. Okay, I nice. think. Actually, okay. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> I, I just use it. <laughs> I don't even know if it's a plugin. Might just be like a, a feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, cool. Anyway, I'm sure it's not a a third party plugin. All right. Okay, yeah, it's a core feature. Chen, thank you. Yeah. Um. So, so the next question um is well, several people of us were interested in in your use of symbols. And first of all, technically, how do you enter these symbols? Do you use uh, font, of, do you use font ligatures or are these um, are these uh, Unicode characters? Yeah, most of them are just alt codes. I know it's mm -hmm. not super efficient, but usually I always ends up using like the same uh, four or five, so that's actually quite fine. Uh, the one thing I've struggled with the most are like uh, Greek letters, because in medicine you often like talk about like alpha, beta, gamma, stuff like that, and I mm -hmm. always just go, go on Chrome, Google them, and then paste them into my. It's kind of slow, but I haven't found a better way as of now. I was thinking to set up some auto hotkeys. If you know what that is, it's a, a program that allows you to uh, remap shortcut on your keyboard, but I haven't really worked on that too much. But yeah, alt codes pretty much. Can I yeah. just jump in there? Um, just, just on these symbols, um, auto hotkey is really good. And espanso, espanso, I'll type it in the chat. It's a text expand and they already have like community packages for like Greek symbols and some medical stuff as well. It's quite helpful. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you very much. I'll note it down. 
Mm -hmm. And then going from there, um, more to the semantic level. So I think I can just quote the question if I find it. Um, well, yeah, how do you decide um, where to use symbols and where not to use symbols? Uh, usually whenever I can, I use symbols. That's like my oh. sort of like uh, thought. Like uh, generally, whenever I can try to make it as short as possible, I do that. So unless it's really necessary for me to explain something so that the, a symbol is not sufficient, I will just use a symbol. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Do you think this could be expanded in some way? So imagine if you had, uh, if you weren't limited by technicalities, if you would re could really do whatever you want, how would you extend your use of, of text symbols and stuff? Huh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Like, I mean, my the, the idea behind symbols is to uh, allow your digital notes to be as similar as possible to your like uh, physical paper notes. So like yeah. in a paper notes, when you write something down, you're gonna try to make it as short as possible because you don't actually want to uh, waste your time actually writing stuff down. Uh, on a computer, it's kind of harder to think about that because you actually just typing something out takes so little time that usually you don't even care about making it shorter. But why I make it shorter is not for the time it takes me to type it out, but for the time it takes me to read it later on. So like uh, for me, typing like uh, increase or drawing an upwards arrow is pretty much the same time on a keyboard. But uh, when I actually go read it, if I have to see uh, this, oh, sorry, if I have to go see this or I have to go see uh, okay. something like that, like this is gonna be, way quicker to understand in terms of reading speed. Absolutely. Okay, okay, nice. Okay, any more question or I'm gonna move to the organizing part? Let me see. Um, uh, I have a specific question. Okay, go uh, ahead. Right. It's, it's just about uh, how you organize your kind of lecture notes apart from like the notes in obsidian just to kind of give an idea get an idea of like how they differ as you said you do your lecture notes uh, on paper because you find it easier to learn yeah uh, i do uh, okay so this is kind of messy because my lecture notes are very messy as like a, a whole concept uh, because uh, here in italy in medicine specifically we don't really follow lectures a lot uh, mainly because we have to learn a lot of stuff of stuff people also have to have like rotations in the hospital so starting from like year three or something like that you kind of start skipping lessons and uh, that's like possible because of how the system is structured here it is kind of dumb I, I have to actually admit it like it's not a good system but the system like allows you and almost wants you to not go to lectures so as of right now i'm not following lectures uh, in the last years, I had just for, for some time. And, and what I did there was to take paper notes uh, with the uh, Cornell method. So just simply uh, have a note or simply like notes of what the, what the professor is saying. And then on the left, I will put questions. And when I go to put them into Obsidian, what I will do is uh, I will use the Cornell question as prompt to write something down and then check if that corresponds to my lecture notes. And uh, another thing is that usually lecture notes for me are almost never actually enough for my exam preparations. So they will always have to be integrated into like a textbook or other resources. So what I would usually do is probably start from my lecture notes, write something down from that just to, so that I can have like my first recall using the, the questions prompt from the Cornell method. Uh, and then from that, I'm gonna start to expand and mostly everything I have my lecture notes is going to be replaced by stuff from a textbook usually was that uh clear yes that was perfect thank you so much i'm also studying medicine so it it's really related so i'm really glad to be here today thank you cool uh, thank you thank you for the question okay there's one more question i think i think we can um, tackle that right now um, Sam is asking whether you are finding the use of uh, linked references and unlinked references, um, um, whether you're using that a lot when working with your notes. Uh, yeah, okay. 
that, that that's perfect because that question leads uh, into the next step of my of my nice. presentation. So uh, we we now talked about like just the the very like practical uh, note taking aspect, and now the next part is like how do you organize these notes, and that therefore how do you use the links and the reference and unlinked reference to actually organize the notes. So uh, I'm going to answer the question in the next explanation, and, and then if you still have some doubts about it, I'm gonna you can ask it a more specific question at the end. Okay, is that Good. I, I don't know who asked the question, but <laughs> that's my response for now. Okay, yep, great. Uh, I'm gonna move on then. Okay, so so as as I just said, we have our notes now, and how do I organize them? Okay, first thing I do is to keep an index of everything I do. So this is like my main uh, big index of every notes I have on everything. As you can see, here are some of the first lecture notes I took. I took some lecture notes on Obsidian because I'm lazy and I want to actually take them on paper. But as you can see, this is like five lecture notes. So as you can see, I stopped after a very short while. Just wanted to show you what actually lecture notes are in here. Uh, so for my, this big index is just almost uh, the main reason I have it is because so I don't forget about stuff. So if I make a new note, I'm always sure I will have a reference in my index. So something I do whenever I open a note, I'm gonna go open my sidebar and check if I have a, a link mentions in my index. And if I have it, that note, is, that note is good to go. If it doesn't have it, I'm gonna make it. So this allows me to just make sure that everything uh, I have is gonna be in one page here and that it's gonna be covered when I go to review stuff. So when it, whenever I review, uh, I'm gonna be sure that everything here has to be covered. And if it isn't, I will see it from here. So. The, the main problem I have with organizing notes, uh, at least personally, is how do you go ahead in uh, first using indexes and sub-indexes, and then how do you split the notes? So when is the note big enough that you need to actually make a reference to it? When does it become an, its own page, and when it's just like something written inside this page? Uh, I'm going to explain it better in the later on. First, to just conclude my uh, the thing on indexes and sub-indexes. As you can see right now, I only have one big index of everything I need to know. Uh, for the last exam I prepared, I also had sub-indexes. And I think this is very situational. I just wanted to address the thing. So like in this case, I have many things, but almost all of them uh, uh, play plays into each other. So like it doesn't make sense for me to make a separate index for something that's just going to be referenced so much in the first one as well. Uh, instead of the last exam I, I had to study for, it was a physiology exam. So uh, it was divided in like heart physiology and then uh, renal physiology, pulmonary physiology, stuff like that. And in that case, I had an index for each of the of the different organs of the body. And, and it was very convenient because it was very split up and there were not many concepts that, that overlap between the various uh, organs. In this case, this is a pathology exam. So pretty much all the mechanisms are referenced in the other pages. So it didn't really make sense for me to have a, a sub-index in this case. So uh, this is the things with, with index. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is tags. So I don't use tags. Why don't I use tags? Like tags are a feature in Obsidian, they're quite useful, everybody uses tags. Why don't I use tags? Uh, there are two main reasons. Tags usually serves one of two purposes. Uh, the first purpose is to like organize stuff and to group things. Uh, and for that I have index, so I don't really need tags for that. Uh, and the, the second thing I uh, that tags are used for is to use as a state uh, symbol. So like, uh, I think um, Brian made this popular. I'm not sure uh, if I remember correctly, but the use of like uh, a tag to indicate if a note is being made, if you have to actually review it. it, it the tags is made to indicate what you have to do with the notes, what not what the notes is, what the note is. Uh, why don't I use that? Because I have my notion system so like I don't need to specify what I need to do with that note because it's also because it's already specified in another system uh, so it would be just uh, a loop uh, like uh, I would just be a waste of time to <laughs> uh, write the thing twice so this is why I don't use tags I do think tags could be useful especially if you don't have another system that you rely to, that you rely on to organize your stuff and to explain what you have to do with each notes but in my situation tags are not needed. So this is why you won't see any tags in any of, the, of these notes. Okay, and then we move on to the other things, which I uh, talked about a little bit before. 
uh, and that is splitting nodes. That's one of the uh, the main problem I had when I started to use Obsidian, and I must I assume it's a problem some of you also had. So like, how do you know when it's time to make a new page? How do you know when it's time to keep going? How do you know what what is like just a subtitle and what is what deserves a note on its own? So. In terms of this, uh, I don't have a clear answer, unfortunately. I'm just gonna tell you what I do and how I approach the problem on my part and the kind of like trial and error that I've made uh, in the months I've used Obsidian. So uh, the first thing is, uh, the main point, however, the, the, the end of this discussion is gonna be that I just go with the flow, quote unquote. So like I try to see where the nodes take me and when it's time to split, I split. And when it's not time to split, I just keep going. Uh, another thing, I to keep in mind uh, on a like philosophy level is the fact that uh, it's more important to write first and organize later. So like you can split your notes later, you can reorganize your notes later. The first step is it's important for you to actually take the notes and then later on you can worry about organizing them. Uh, this is also because organizing notes can be a very powerful way to actually review your notes. So I think it's not really that necessary for you to worry too much about organizing your notes when you're actually taking them. Uh, and rather, it's very important in the beginning that you actually get your information down on your on your screen. Uh, another thing I try to keep in mind when I decide where to split the notes are headers. So as you can see, uh, here I have the, the headers in the various like header one, header two, and stuff like that. Usually, when you start to get like to header three, four, five, around number four, I feel like it's time to stop and it's time to actually split the notes. So when I start to see that I need too many sub Headers, I, I, I always take that as a hint to, it's time to split the notes, it's time to move it somewhere else. And uh, maybe in the main note, you, you might leave a small reference to what we're talking about, but then you actually wanna have a new note for that argument on its own. Uh, an example of this could be uh, this page. Uh, as you can see here, I had many like subtitles and I left the, the title of the, of the new page as a header, but then I actually put the, the stuff in another page. Because as you can see, this is quite a lot of material. Is also might need to be actually refractured into more notes, which I haven't done yet. But the main point is, uh, header are good, like indicator of when it's time to split a note, or, or at least I use them as such. Okay, so that was my like philosophy on splitting notes, uh, and therefore my philosophy on how I organize them. And the uh, uh, the other thing is I also have uh, another sort of like things I do in terms of organization is what do I do with stuff that's like very um, mnemonics and very like um, numbers pretty much. What, are, what, what should I do with numbers I need to memorize because just reading them in a note is not gonna be enough. What I have, it's over here on all the way on the right. I always keep this open and this is simply an Anki dump as you can see from the name. So this is a dump of very like numerical information and stuff like that that I'm gonna need to just memorize like brute force memorization. I just drop them here and then I'm gonna move them to Anki. I know there's like a, an Anki plugin, but I feel like that's more useful for like big uh, export and stuff like that. Instead, I usually, as you can see, I don't have many information. So I just move them by hand and stuff like that. Uh, this is something I just implemented because before I used to just keep Anki open and make flashcards as I go. But what I realized that is that often I will not open Anki because it's very rare for me to actually encounter something like that that I actually need to memorize. So I never open it. And then when it actually comes time to have like a very specific information that I need to memorize, I just forget about it. So they never get made. And I, I just make them at the end when I'm actually reviewing. Uh, instead, this way I can make sure that every number has its own uh, little section. So then I can just move this to Anki at the end of the day or whenever I feel like it. This is just to simplify my organization between these two programs. And uh, lastly, in terms of, uh, sorry, in terms of like the, my usage of links and backlinks, which uh, also is to answer the question that uh, I don't remember who asked before. Uh, as you can see, uh, in this page, there are not a lot of links actually. But what I usually do, I will refer to, there we go. I'm messing this up, okay. What I will usually do is to have some references to stuff I've done before in my in my in my document. I don't really use the bar too much. What I use is maybe to check if something has been linked in a place where I know it should be linked, and I don't see it linked. So, like, if I want to make sure that this uh, type of information is also linked in some way, I'm gonna be check if it's actually if the link is actually there. And most importantly, I use this for the index. So I don't really use the 
the actual linked mentions and non-linked mentions page too much. Uh, what I do is I actually use linked mentions to travel back and forward between things that are connected. Of course, that's like the main use for them. And the other thing I do is I tend to uh, actually make uh, links to stuff that doesn't exist. So I think there was one here, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there you go. As you can see, here's something that doesn't exist. I do this because I know that uh, that concept is gonna be um, addressed in the future. So what I will do is just drop a link, knowing that at some point I will review that. And the fact that I take notes and uh, read material at different times also really helps with this. So like if I'm gonna uh, take notes now on something I studied one week ago, in that week I will probably have gone forward on my textbooks. So now I will know if that thing is going to link to things in the future. I don't know if that made too much sense, but uh, in case, just ask me again at the end. Um, the main point, though, is that I will just make links to things that don't exist yet. And then when I actually go to make a page, so for example, uh, this is about, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, is when you get a transplant and your body just refuses it. I don't know exactly the term, but uh, the point being, when I go into my index to make a new note about, let's say I have, I've now come to the point where I need to learn about that, when, when, where I have, need to take notes about that, I will double square bracket and check if there's something that looks like that. So I would just like, uh, that's what I just made, or maybe something like transplant. As you can see, there's something that already says transplant, but it's not the same thing. So in any case, I will check if something exists before I create a, a new page. Uh, I do this mainly because this way it's going to be easier to have um, the, up, the the reference update. Because if I just created a new page, let's go, let's say uh, like transplant, okay. without checking if there's anything similar already, I'm just going to make this new page, and then everywhere else where I had it referenced instead of transplant as trapianti, which is how you say that in Italian, uh, if I'm going to have it, all of this is not this link is not going to update. So what I do is I just check beforehand and then make the link. I'm sorry if that was kind of messy, but I hope that was clear enough for most of you. Uh, okay. Okay. So in terms of organization, this was like most of the things I, I wanted to talk about. So if there are any questions on this, uh, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'm just going to quickly show you some quality of life things like uh, plugins I use and themes and stuff like that. It's just going to be very quick. And maybe we can have more like uh, substantial questions at the end. Yeah, I think you go ahead and then we'll do more discussion at the end. OK, I yeah. have, I have Let's some do... things written down, but we can address them later. OK, yeah, I, I think it's better because this part is going to be quite quick. So maybe it's okay, better yeah. if I just talk about it. OK. So so in terms of like quality of life suggestion I'd like to make, these are a bunch of things I use in Obsidian. And I think most of these are going to be like really just super small things that just allows you to move faster through your through your notes. And I mean, as every like kind of sort of like productivity junkie or th stuff like that, you want to be able to do stuff as fast as possible. So even just having to, 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 to click one time more is not going to be fine for me. So. The things I have here are advanced tables. This is a plugin that I a plugin that allow you to uh, format tables. So just in case you don't know it, it allows you to. Here's the demo to make table in Obsidian way better because table in Obsidian are, are very nice, but are kind of messy. So this makes it easier for you. Next up, I have cycle through paints, which you saw me use a lot right now. Is just that allows you to cycle through notes as you would in like uh, tabs on a browser. So I use control tab and I can move through my notes. Uh, next up, I have final link files. I use this at the end of my note taking. So after my I, I, I finish taking all my notes, I will just pop in, do the, unsol the, the unlink files and see if there's anything I made and it's somewhere lost in my vault. Just to make sure that we'll cover that when I go to actually review stuff. Uh, this is just pretty much for safety reasons. <laughs> then we have maximize active pain. You saw me use this as well. Is simply a plugins that allow you to maximize on the, play, on the pane you have active right now. I have Control Shift X as my hotkey. I can just pop in and out very easy, just for navigation purposes. Then we have Mind Map. I don't know if you ever saw this plugin, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's very popular, but it's quite cool, but kind of messy. So you can preview the node as a mind map, 
now it doesn't show up here, but if you can see, it's gonna be right here. For some reason, if I zoom into this, it just disappears. So uh, unfortunately, we can't really see them in, in a good way. So I, we're gonna have to squeeze it right here. As you can see, what it does is it makes a mind map of your, of your entire node. The main problem with this is that, as you can see, it gets messy quite quickly. <laughs> so I think it's nice for very short nodes, but as soon as you start having bigger list or stuff like that, it gets super messy. So I remember just, I added it a bunch of time ago, knowing that it had, that it had potential, but never actually used it. So yeah, I think it has potential, but I don't really know how to use it yet. Just wanted to, to mention it because I think it's really useful. It's really cool, more than useful. Next up, I have Node Refactor. This just allows you to split nodes and to put the node content to another node. And it's just a quick way to actually separate nodes and split them. Uh, it's very useful as well. Next up, we have Outliner. Of course, as you saw, everything, all the nodes I take are in uh, an outline form. Therefore, Outliner is very useful for me. That allows me to write quicker. Quick Switcher++ simply uh, allows you to have some more uh, features in the, in, the, in the search bar. Then I have sliding panes that you can see down here. Uh, that's just pretty much for when I need to have two things open at the same time. It allows me to move faster between the two. And most importantly, when I have lots of stuff open, uh, if I now split a bunch of times, uh, as you can see, if they weren't, if sliding panes was, was not activated, I wouldn't be able to see any of this. This way I can scroll through them. I'm sure most of you will know this. And then I have typewriter scroll which is like the simpler plugin in here, but the one I love the most. It's simply just when you go into, into a node, wherever your cursor is, it will bring it to the, to the center of the screen. This is so simple, yet so effective. Like this was literally the best plugin I've ever used. Uh, I, I remember when I started using Obsidian, I had to scroll every like 30 seconds. Now I don't, and that was the biggest quality of life uh, update ever. Okay, so I think that's it. These are all my plugins in terms of teams, which is like the last like small things. Right now I'm using Atom. Uh, I run through them a couple, sometimes I change. Nothing really, I'm not really committed to any team. I, li I like to change them up. <laughs> I just wanted to touch on that because I don't know to, to say that. <laughs> and yeah, there are a lot of other plugins I want to test out, but I haven't had the time yet. Uh, one of it is Excalidraw, which I talked about before. And then I have like a whole list of things I want to try out, but did just couldn't have the time with to do that. Yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for listening. And yeah, thanks for coming to my Obsidian talk. <laughs> now we can go into <laughs> questions. Awesome. <laughs> thanks, dude. Um, there's a bunch of questions. Um, I also want to repeat that um, if uh, you're not feeling very comfortable speaking while we are recording, um, we will do a bit of Q&A and discussion now and then stop the recording and then this, the call will stay open for more discussions. Okay, so uh, one question is, uh, do you have a specific file or folder structure or something that you're using? Uh, oh, I actually forgot to mention this. Uh, I also use uh, nested vaults. So uh, mm. I didn't show it right now because right now I just show you my uh, my pathology vault. This is like the, the, the exam I'm taking right now. So in terms of folder, I don't have really lots of folders. I just have a media folder, a template folder. Uh, and these were a bunch of like lab things. So that needs to be separated because it was a past exam. And then everything else is here in here is just kind of messy. Uh, I use the the at symbol for just uh, the things that I want to be at the top of the list and then anything else is kind of messy. All this thing here with the dates where at the time I actually took some lecture notes. So this is just what some lecture notes might look. Uh, this is, as you can see, this is a lot messier than my actual notes and there are not a lot of symbols or titles or stuff like that. It's just a bunch of things thrown here, but I actually never actually used them too much. I just did it because I wanted to be able to write stuff down as I heard it because it allows me to remember better. But as you can see, this is very messy and not very important. Uh, in terms of folder structure, uh, uh, I have a, a main vault that's called uni, where I have uh, everything, uh, all my exams folders. But I actually almost never use this vault. Uh, yeah, it's kind of messy as well. Uh, the main thing I use this for is that when uh, I actually need to link stuff between 
exams. So that doesn't really happen because usually when I'm studying for one exam, I'm not going to be referencing stuff from another exam. But the more I go forward to my study, uh, the more I realize that starts to happen. So right now, this is very messy because I haven't really used it before, but I'm going to start to use it a lot more. And the idea is that I'm going to write uh, write in this bolt, and then I'm going to review and repeat in this one. So if there's anything I need to link to another subject, I can link it when I review instead of when I write. Because if I start linking when I'm writing, I think that's get messy. So I'd rather uh, have another vault simply for repetitions. And uh, yeah, so in terms of vault organization, I think that's uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't use folders. I don't like folders uh, unless they are nested vaults. Yeah, okay, interesting things. I hadn't even thought about it. Um, okay. Okay, a few more follow up thoughts in the chat are um, about well, how you make your notes accessible uh, when you're not on your computer. This is not immediately related to the talk, but I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, sure. Uh... OK, so the main point is now, <laughs> considering lockdown, I don't really need to be away from my computer. <laughs> but uh, other, other than that, uh, I use uh, a synchronization uh, program called SyncThing, which is uh, here. I don't know if it's going to open up. I don't know. It's like a, a simple system tray uh, synchronization thing that allows me to have my notes synced to my laptop. So yeah, as you can see, this is just the, as you can see, you know, recent file downloads and stuff like that. And uh, whenever I'm out, I sync my Obsidian to my, to my laptop. And then when I go out, I grab my laptop and, uh, and go out. Uh, I never actually had to use Obsidian from like, uh, another, for like a friend's computer or library computer or stuff like that. So I never really uh, worried too much about having uh, sort of like, uh, I don't know, cloud sync or stuff like that. Yeah, this is the sync thing interview, uh, interface, in case you were curious. This is the service I use to sync my desktop to my laptop. Anyways, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it about synchronization. And I also use, uh, yeah, I, I used to sync to sync with Drive, but I don't think I do anymore because I changed computer. But yeah, you can use cloud synchronization. And uh, yeah, and I have literally a USB where I just chuck my Obsidian in and bring it with me for, for any other needs. And uh, what else I want to say? Oh, yeah, and you can use, I think you can use uh, Obsidian Git, which is another one of the plugins I need to learn about. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Which is, yeah, this one. I don't exactly know how it works. I, I have to say that, but I think it's useful for synchronization and using Obsidian outside of your computer. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm a noob with this. So just, just wanted to say that I think you can do that, but I'm not even sure about it. Yeah, I think you can. Okay, yeah. So when um when when studying and reviewing, do you actually use a graph view at all? Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, I, I would like to say that I've tr I've struggled with the, the graph view as well. Like I think it's a really useful um, thing, but I never actually managed to to use it uh, efficiently. Uh, the main reason is when I open the graph view, I'm I just opened right now. As you can see, it's kind of messy. Everything is super connected. I'm gonna just, no, no, I wanted to hide. Yeah, okay. Everything is like hyper connected. So it's kind of hard to navigate the graph without getting lost in it. Uh, mostly also because like, this is my index in the middle and it's just gonna be connected to everything which kind of makes it even more messy. But yeah, uh, I never really got too much into learning how the graph works. But I do think you can use it for review if you start jumping from one thing to the other following the graph. Uh, I just never really managed to, to make it work for me. I do think it's useful, though. I, I wanted to say that. What about the local graph view? Have you said? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I never actually looked at my local graph too much, I think. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Mm, Main point is, I don't think there are many situations in which looking at my local graph will actually help me review. Because, mm. yeah. I don't know, I mean, the, the other problem 
like with the local graph is that some things uh, are related in a very specific way. The adjusting the connection is not going to be enough. For example, something very, very simple. Uh, this is, uh, okay. As you can see here, uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to have to explain a little bit of what it's written in here. Uh, this is about, uh, uh, I don't want to go into medical stuff, but the main point is here, I'm talking about hypersensibility, which is like allergies, so like you overreact to something. And uh, your, of course, your overreaction involves uh, the activation of a bunch of things. And like, uh, these are just a bunch of things that are activated uh, due to that hypersensibility. Now, having the link, of my, oops, I opened the, the big graph. Now seeing that hypersensibility is connected to just a, a random activation system doesn't really mean anything to me. I want to know why the connection is made. And I can see that if I go into my actual node and see where the connection is made. So usually I will jump through stuff using the link in the files, but the graph usually is not enough for me to actually make the connection. I think it might be useful if you're just uh, talking about some you're trying to repeat a big thing and then you start jumping from one thing to the other and then you can see okay why is that connected you can see it as like a, a, a question from so like i will look at my local graph and see okay why is this mechanism connected to this thing and then that will be a good prompt to to try and repeat something but in general i don't really use graph too much i think it can be used but it doesn't really work with the way i structure my my files mm. I think in the local graph, you also, you can, uh, I, I think you have the option to include um, a larger neighborhood, right? Like you can use more the than I'm immediate, sorry, to, to include more nodes than the immediate neighborhood. I think you can also include like two or three hop neighborhoods, right? Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, for depth, like with the, the slider at the top, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. So that would, could be potentially interesting because you would like see see like two hop neighborhoods or three hop neighborhoods. Um, but as you see, uh, it explodes fairly quickly. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. <oop. laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the, thing, the thing that this is the index and the index is, is messing it up. I think you can filter it so the index doesn't show, but I don't, don't exactly know how to do that. Okay. Um, okay. Is there anything I missed in the chat? If so, if I missed something, please yeah, type I, again. <laughs> I'm trying to read as well, um, but I, I don't know where, you, where where I was left. Yeah, but there was a bunch of discussion going on. If there's something we, we should address here. Could I put forward a point of discussion? Um, oh yeah, okay, now I know how to filter things out of the graph, thanks to, I don't know who suggested it, but well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. helpful. Okay, yeah, thank um, you. I, I was looking for that the other day. <laughs> sure. Um, just what we were discussing in the chat now uh, about more journal articles specifically, so instead of just reading from a textbook and, and making notes on that, um, I'm curious how others handle like writing a paper using lots of academic sources, um, like what your process of that is. Would you take highlights and extract things and then add your own thoughts under that? Um, and how would you like integrate that then into the thing you're working on? It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately I will not be able to answer very well, mainly because we don't have any of that in the university I do. So like I almost never have to refer to PDFs or stuff like that. All I have is going to be a big textbook and that's going to be my, my reference. So I know that mm, I, I, I also see that a lot in the in the Discord server, like most of the discussion in the academia page is going to are going to be about like PhD students where you have to reference a lot of like a study material and lots of PDFs and highlights and using uh, Zotero and stuff like that. In my situation, I don't really need that. I do think it's, it's like one of the coolest thing you can do with Obsidian, but unfortunately I don't really have the time to look into it too much because it's not what I need to do for actual university. So yeah, it's a really great question, but unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to answer in a very satisfying way. <laughs> For sure. Um, do, do you use lots of different textbooks and, and do you have to cite them um, in your work at all? 
uh, I usually what I usually use is actually not even a real textbook. I usually use uh, a sort of transcript of lectures that's integrated with uh, other information coming from either uh, professors like documents or other textbooks. So uh, that's like uh, okay, that's kind of like a very uh, specific things we do in uh, not even our university, but like in general in Madison University in Italy. What you will do is people will record the professor and they're gonna write the transcript and then they're gonna reorganize the trans transcript so that it looks like a, a textbook. I, I can open one up for you so that you can see what I'm talking about. So as you can see, this is structured like pretty much like a textbook. Like this is the index. And as you can see here, like right, paragraphs and then uh, there are gonna be some images here and there. So like it's very structured, but all this is is actually just a, a recording and then the transcript. So this is usually our main study materials. Uh, and this is because professors tend to ask the things that they actually explain. So uh, this is usually what we use to prepare our exams. And sometimes we will integrate this with actual uh, textbooks that we managed to, to obtain or through PDFs or stuff like that. But this is very often our main source of information. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that is quite different. Um... In, in medicine students use case. Um, and it's good that you've covered that because like you said on the Discord, it's mostly um, like PhD kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, which is one of the reason I wanted to like actually try and give this talk because I always see in the Discord, the discussion is mainly around how to you write stuff and how to use cite stuff. Instead in my situation is always about like learning how to say stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and it was, Um, I see Ben just stepped away. What, one question that um, has come up a couple of times is how do you handle the, the media in your vault, like different images? And do you use like audio files or anything? Uh, I don't use audio files. I never tried. I don't think, uh, oh, I don't think right, if you ask me like right now on the spot, I don't think they're a good thing. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is that usually an audio is just a slower version of a written thing. So anytime you have an audio, usually it's always better to have a written form of it. The only situation in which I see audio could be useful uh, is like if you have to like hard sounds or like long sounds, stuff like that that you actually need to hear, there's no way around it. You could integrate that, but I've never come across anything like that for now. I, I imagine I'm gonna have to some days, but uh, as of now, no audio. And in terms of media, I simply have my a big media folder when I chuck all of my images and then I just paste them in here and I rarely have to reference an image more than once so what I will do is usually just keep the standard name I have no idea what these are but when I paste them in right now there are not a lot of images in here uh, I actually don't use lots of images which is bad because I think images are good but uh, usually I just don't have them easy for me to, to just use so that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about trying out ex the Escali draw plugin because I think that's a good way to implement images in in a in a better way. But as you can see, yeah, here this is just an example of an image I have, and I just copied it from somewhere, pasted it in here, and this is the thing I have. Uh, I do use a bunch of CSS snippet to to make my images a little bit prettier. So I have the the zoom and the I don't know if there's going to be anything here, but I also use the the image flag snippet that allows you to put images to the side, which is another very, very useful thing because usually having images like this in the middle is kind of annoying. Instead, if you just put them to the side, just to show you in case you don't know what I'm talking about, you just add pipe plus side to an image and the image is gonna be simply shifted to the side. And that's very, very useful in case you have to use lots of images. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I, I suppose we can just keep going through some of the questions here. Um, yeah, sure. And another one is um, still kind of on the images. There's this Im Imger, Imger, I don't know how to pronounce it, that plugin. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah it can be helpful to keep things out of your, out of your vault. Uh, I have no idea how it works. I, I know it exists, but I'm really finding it hard to keep up with the with the <laughs> with the plugins. So okay, so it just up uploads the stuff to Imgur instead of having it in your vault. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you've got a lot okay. of images that can help, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I have lots of images. Kind of looks like a lot, maybe more than I actually realize. Yeah, I never really had a problem with images. Is that a space reason, I, I would say, I would guess? Yeah, yeah, it might be a space issue for some. Um, yeah. Yeah, can be. Um, yeah, sure. I, I guess that's a good that's a good thing, but I never actually had the need for it. I want to try to read some things in chat. I think we missed some questions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, basically, all image all image stories. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, right now, I have no real need for it, but I do think it might be useful in case I start to run out of space or start to add like a really big number of uh, images. As of now, most of these are just like screenshots of stuff, so they're not even that heavy. They're just low quality pictures. Okay, Meta School is in Uruguay is the same. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Additional papers. Yeah, this is the Zotero and like re reference. Yeah, there was there was one Thanks. question uh, a bit higher up about how do you set up your workspaces and uh, for what contexts? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I don't actually use workspaces a lot. Like usually what I simply have is uh, okay now it's messy because I opened a lot of stuff up to show you but it just blows everything okay what I usually have is on the left I will have my index on the middle I will have the stuff I'm working on so like let's just pick up last thing I just opened for the for the revision and then on my right I will have my Anki my Anki dump in case I need to to dump anything here and then I will just zoom in on this work on this get out make a new node and then keep going like this uh, so I never really bother too much learning about workspace because I don't use much more than this. Like if I ever open my, my left pane, I will just have uh, linked mentions and the, the, the outline of the page. So I never really bother too much because I don't really use many different workspaces. What I kind of do is uh, I was thinking about uh, using workspaces for like uh, studying and then revision, but I haven't actually arrived at the point when I'm re where I'm reviewing this stuff. So I never actually made a workspace for this. And the last time I did, I I just didn't do it. I just uh, simply, I was simply going through the notes in preview mode and, uh, and, and that was it. Uh, I was just scrolling through them. I do think workspaces are really cool, but in my situation, it's simply a question of not having to actually use many different things uh, often. So I hope that answered the question. I'm sorry, I, I I don't use a lot of like very advanced stuff. I try to keep it very bare bones because my objective is to take notes fast, not to not lose too much time in like uh, small stuff. <laughs> I hope that was. Yeah, I think it makes sense to to use things uh, the way it makes sense to you, and it, it's not necessary to use all the advanced features if uh, you don't need them. I think it's it's a great way to go about this. Um, there was another question a bit higher up also about, um, I mean, maybe related a bit to what we were talking about Sotero and citing, um, but it, there might be some something that you do here. Um, do you have some way of making or of, of differentiating between your own thoughts about something or your own notes and um, yeah, the, the source, let's say? Okay, yeah, uh, this is usually, uh... Okay, usually I don't really have to express my own thoughts much. Uh, and usually there are two situations in which I will say something that's not uh, specifically coming for my, from my textbook or like from anything more serious. And those two situations are going to be uh, where I actually need to write like a note for myself. Like, yeah, you should review this or you should try to link this to this. Uh, in case I need to do something like this, I will simply put a comment. So like uh, link this to whatever. I'll write it down here and then I'll remember to do the next time I do it. And instead, in terms of like more like serious, like uh, personal thoughts and stuff, uh, I hardly ever do that because uh, in medicine, I don't really ever, like my input is not really that important. Like <laughs> I need to know stuff. I don't need to say what I think about stuff. So what I usually do is just write uh, very like simple stuff from the textbook. and. The only situation in which I actually write stuff from like my own mind and try to re-elaborate, it will usually be very obvious for for the from the way I actually write stuff. So like it will be a lot more informal and it will be a lot simpler and a lot less technical and even less condensed. 
uh, in terms of literally how it's written. So that's usually how I differentiate between the two. But also keep in mind that very often uh, I will not uh, need to say stuff that's my own personal thoughts. And uh, by the way, uh, I've taken a, a bunch of questions here, but if anyone here wants to actually like say something, like uh, I wanted to make this talk also a discussion. So like, for example, about the workspace thing before, if anybody has a, a better way to use workspace, I'm very curious to hear what you guys think. Yeah, feel feel free, guys, to raise your hands if you do want to to un or yeah unmute yourselves and ask questions directly. But if not, then I, I just keep uh, getting questions from the chat for for ways. Um, so the next sure. one I see on the list, and I think I, I'm not sure if we already covered this one. Um, is if you could maybe do a small walkthrough of how a review session looks like. Um, do you double things in your, for example, in your headings or in your lists, um, or do you use the index? Where, where do you start? Okay, sure. Uh, this is something like I, I didn't want to talk about too much because it doesn't really rely on Obsidian, but what I will do is usually this. Uh, whenever I start a review session, I will go to my Notion. So here I will see what I need to review, let's say. Uh, I will open it up and what I have here is usually I will have some questions. So these are written from the first time I read the stuff. So after reading the first stuff, I, the, the first thing I do is jot down some quick questions and I use this the first time I take notes. So these are going to be my question prompt for my note taking. And after that, I'm going to repeat and add more questions over here for each repetition. So this is going to be repetition number one. I'm going to note if I did something wrong, I'm going to say like, uh, that, that was bad or I didn't remember that. Uh, and then here I'm gonna add questions that are gonna be try to actively target the things I knew the worst. Uh, and in Obsidian, this means I'm gonna just go to, uh, I don't know, a random note I need to, to review. Let's do it from the, from, the, from the index. I will turn it, of course, to preview mode usually. Not all the time, sometimes I just keep it in edit mode because I don't really care about it too much. And I will, what I will do now is usually I'll read the titles. In this case, I use like uh, normal text as titles and then the, the list underneath as like the actual content. So I'll, I will read this. And after I read this, I will think about what I'm gonna say and then I'm gonna say it and then check down here to say if I said it well. Uh, now, this sounds very simple. Usually it's very messy. So what will happen is I will probably like stand up, walk around the room, read the title, try to say everything I know about this. And then I will sit down and check if I said everything I needed to do. And if I didn't, I will note it on my Notion. Uh, I will add a question specific for that. Uh, I also usually uh, like to draw stuff. So I have, I, I don't have it right now, but I had a whiteboard. I will draw stuff on my whiteboard and be sure that I actually reviewed everything. So in the review process, uh, Obsidian is pretty much the place where I check if I said everything right. Um, I do use the toggle thing sometime, especially when I notice that I'm like skipping ahead. Usually I don't. So usually when I read something, I'm going to start from the top and I'm going to read this, then I'm going to read this, then I'm going to read this. So I don't really need to toggle it. But uh, sometimes I will see myself like cheating. So like <laughs> I will read this and be like, oh yeah, I remember this and I'm going to start reading this. If I catch myself doing that, I will collapse it and then say, okay, wait, hold on a second. Let me try to uh, actually recall it. And then I'm going to open it back up and try to repeat it. Uh, if I notice myself, doing it too much, I will simply fold everything uh, and then start from the top and start to unfold stuff uh, to actually force myself to recall uh, in case I was unquote cheating. But usually what I will do is simply stand up, repeat everything I know, and then use Obsidian as uh, a check for what I said. Uh, something else I do sometimes from time to time is I will simply uh, start writing down stuff. I, I usually do this uh, like right before taking notes. So for example, if I'm gonna take notes on this thing, right before I do it, uh, actually let's open uh, this one. So for example, this is something I still need to take some notes on. I just put the title in, but I didn't have the time to actually start. So what I will do when I take notes and how do I transform my note taking session into a repetition session is I will open this up, which is my, uh, these are my notes from the first time I read it. Oops, uh, I wanna read the first question and try to answer it. And sometimes I will force myself to actually write some stuff down. So I will write in here what I think about the what, what the, about the questions, and then I will just take my notes. I don't do this all the time because, of course, it takes a little bit more time. Uh, sometimes I just jump straight into note-taking. Other times I will actually do the repetition. 
So I hope that was clear. That was kind of messy because my repetition is kind of messy. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, great that it was clear. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think um, it, it uh, yeah, you, you went through a pretty comprehensive uh, workflow. And um, yeah, I, I think that answers the question. Um, okay, great. Yeah, Rose, do you remember this question about backlinks? Was it already asked? Um, Colby, I'm not sure if you're referring to the question above about using tasks, or is that with Maki Mochi? Um, I'm not sure. There is one question about um, do you use tasks at all, like checklists in Obsidian? Mm, no, I, I use. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I use that at all. Uh, my checklist is the, my just my my work in a notion. So like my checklist would be to complete these three things for today. Yeah, the third thing jumped over here, but like my checklist to this, this, and this, and uh, I don't really use them in notion, in uh, Obsidian. Sorry. Okay, uh, I I think the question about uh, backlinks was uh, whether you use backlinks at some point in in your writing process. I think you already covered this one, but. Uh, I think the question from Paul is more about um, how do you connect things together? So you are reviewing a quite large set of concepts and you have uh, probably a lot of nodes. How do you know which of these nodes are um, already have something to connect to um, and do the backlink uh, pain help with this, for example? Uh, yeah, so I, I addressed it a little bit before. Uh, the main thing I would like to say is that I don't really use the pain too much. This is because the, the pain kind of gets, uh, now in this case, I don't have lots of notes here, but if I switch to something else, uh, I will probably have many, many, many things here. Yeah, as you can see, uh, this is not really comprehensible. Now, I also picked something that's very, very uh, discussed. So of course, this is gonna be even more messy on some other pages, it's gonna be a little bit better, but uh, I cannot really, understand this too much personally. So I don't really use it much. What I do is, is I will actually navigate through this link whenever I'm reviewing. So uh, for example, uh, if I read this and then don't remember what we're talking about here, I will jump into this page and check what we're talking about. So that's one way I use the links. Uh, another way I use them is the, to have not even, not really indexes, but like for example, the example I had before, this is about all the hypersensibility and as you can see, there are four types. So I'm going to have a list here with uh, a bunch of like short information on, of all four types. And then when I actually do my repetition, what I will do is I will jump, I will have these open, and then I'm going to open this in another pane. I will repeat this, and then I will go back here, open this in another pane, repeat this, and and go like that. So uh, I also use links as a way to make sure I cover all the material I need to know about. Uh, another way I use it. Uh, in terms of practical use is to simply avoid rewriting stuff. So if I need to reference something that's already written somewhere else, I will sometimes just drop a link and say, yeah, you can find that there. Uh, I will sometimes rewrite stuff where I think that rewriting is useful uh, for learning. So like sometimes uh, first it might be different the context. So for example, something might make sense on its own and something may, may, might, might have a different meaning or at least have some added information in another context. So what I will usually do there is drop a link and then write something like, for example, in this case, uh, as you can see, I have the link, but I also have written something down here. So when I go to review this page, I will be able to just say some of the basic stuff from this first page. And then I will be able to go into more details when I open the actual page uh, and go to repeat this stuff. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much the way I use backlinks. Uh, I was thinking if I do other stuff. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, that, that's, I, I kind of don't have like a very good answer to uh, a broad question like that. I would have to probably like, think about it better to structure uh, a better response. I, I have a question here. Um, if you go back to your coagulation, I don't remember what else now. Sure, yeah. There. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it was this one. It was maybe something else. It doesn't matter. Can you open your, your backlink Spain again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, sure. Sorry. What was this one here? This one, this one. So you have a bunch of unlinked mentions there. 
Um, did, yeah. Do you do anything with them or why did you choose, for example, not to link these things that you have there with the coagulation node? Okay, yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, sometimes I don't think it's necessary to do the links. This is for two reasons. First, to try to keep my pages a little bit more polished. Because if I start linking everything, literally like half of the page is going to be links. Because like there's a, lots of things that are cross-referenced. Uh, so I try to cut it down for clarity reason. Another thing I do is maybe often I will not double link things in the same page. So for example, if I have linked it already somewhere else in the page, I will not link it again because I assume that if I needed to review that, I will I will have followed the, the link before. So I don't need to link it again. Uh, another reason why I don't do it is that uh, this is actually not, doesn't make a lot of sense. Just this is uh, sometimes maybe uh, I will start making links and then realize that that thing is referenced so much everywhere else that if I kept making link, I would literally be linking it to everything else. So I just stop because first at that point, I will be uh, confident in what that talks about because I've already referenced it so much. And secondly, there's no need for me to reference it so much uh, after I realized that that thing is so prevalent everywhere else. I don't know if, I don't know if that really made sense, but the main point here being uh, I do sometimes, I don't need, after a bunch of times I've linked it, I will know it so I don't need to link it again. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense conceptually, but practically that ends up happening a bunch of times. And I'm pretty sure it's what happened here. So like, uh, as you can see, this has been referenced so much in all these things that at the beginning I was like, okay, I need to reference it because I don't know what that is. And if I come across it again, I will not, I will not remember. It. And then after a bunch of times, I will be like, okay, yeah, I know what CID is. I don't need to link it again. If I ever come across it and for some reason I don't remember, I will just search for it and jump into it. So I hope that makes sense. I know it's not super like, uh, a really great reason to do it, but sometimes practicality takes over logic. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very related to your to your workflow, right? So if you don't use the the graph as much to do discovery or reviewing, then um, you don't need to link it everywhere. And the places where you do link it has to be has to make sense, has to be important for you to to have access to this additional node. So it makes sense to not link it to every single node that you have. Um, good. Exactly. We have um, one more question, and and let me know um, about time because now we are we are over the hour yeah. that we had originally planned. So when whenever you are, are ready to stop, then just uh, let us know. In the meantime, we we take more questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. As long as there are questions, I'm, I should be able to answer. Okay, great. Um, can, I, can I jump in here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so. I'm curious about what you, what do you think of the the debate between like manual review versus automation in in doing a lot of the work for you and perhaps you could apply it to like your system of review in because I so you use notion to to manually update when last you reviewed something and and how well you know that thing so that yes. that's pretty manual and maybe you could save some time using like one of the flashcard plugins for example but but there is also an argument to say that there's value in in spending that manual time updating that concept um i'd be curious to hear what you think maybe you can speak about that more generally and also other people's thoughts on that would be really cool Sure, that's a, that's a really great question. And uh, honestly, that's something I struggle with personally. That By that, I mean that I actually prepared an exam by using notes that were kind of like this, maybe a little bit more, uh, more, a little smaller, all in Anki. So I would make like very thorough flashcards, trying to split them up the best I can, uh, and then try to repeat them following the, the, the automatic repetition system. What I found myself doing is that there were way too many repetitions each day, and my flashcards were not made uh, well enough, despite knowing what a good flashcard was. Like I went in knowing that you're not supposed to put too much stuff into your flashcards or it's never gonna be uh, good. You're gonna take too much time repeating and I actually end up making the mistake anyway. So uh, yeah, after that <laughs> I got burned and I realized that I'd rather do it manually that uh, make big flashcards and then get burned by that. I think the main reason is that the, the interval of repetitions are very different if you repeat big concepts or very small information. So I will gladly take something like Anki and something like 
very specific for stuff like numbers. So that's what I have here. So like if I have to remember the amount of red blood cells in your, in your blood, I will of course repeat that with Anki because I will have to repeat it a bunch of times. It's a number, I need to just memorize it. Uh, if I have to talk about, uh, I don't know how you say this in English, is uh, when you have not enough hemoglobin, but anyways, uh, if I have to talk about this, is something way more conceptual. As you can see, there are also a bunch of types of uh, of this of this uh, like sickness of. So like the point being, uh, if I had all of this in Anki, I will just become crazy by repeating it every other day or stuff like that. So I'd rather have one big repetition every like one to two weeks rather than have more frequent repetitions with very smaller concepts. Also because uh, of the way that the information is. Uh, required for me to know so like uh, i'm not supposed to know very some something very small and uh, like very uh, atomic i need to know everything else around it so for me to repeat something that's not uh, connected to everything else is counterproductive for my actual exam preparation so so yeah uh, i all i can say is that i did it and it didn't really work well so what i try to do now is to integrate the automation for stuff that i think uh, can benefit from it and stay away from it for stuff that I, I feel like I'm better off doing on my own. But yeah, I think it's a really great question. I think there are many ways to tackle the same problem. Yeah, nice. I, I like your perspective on this. Um, Nick, is, is this something you want to touch on? So you got your mic. Um, oh, cool, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, anyone can feel free to touch on this too. Um, but yeah, I, I guess personally, I, I tend more towards the side of automation, um, especially with like data view to generate like in indexes for me. Um, yeah, yeah. But then in my talk, uh, there were some good arguments in favor of like manual updating too. I think it's very dependent on, on the, the type of information you need to learn and most importantly, how you're tested on it. So yeah, if you have uh, multiple choice questions, it's very great to just try the, the questions many times. Uh, and if you have to actually like repeat and actually say and explain such a big concept, I, I feel like there's a value in uh, scheduling your own repetition. By the way, yes, it's anemia. I just don't know how medical things are called in English, I'm sorry. Thanks for this talk. It was absolutely fantastic. I think there's a good, good, lots of things that I will take myself to my medical studies. I mean, I'm only on my first year, so there's still a lot of things to go ahead. And I can clearly see like you have really specifically made it because you're how you examine. Like I'm examined with like multiple choice and essay questions more. So it's more directed to that. And I have a bit different styles for doing some of it. Like I use much more tags to get like the bigger concept on. But there's really good points here. I'm thank you for the talk. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to, to, to give this talk is because, it's because many of the discussion about studying is always like very focused on the, uh, let's say, American style of questions or like very lots of multiple choice, lots of essays. Instead, I wanted to give like this different kind of perspective. But yeah, thank you very much for your input. Yeah, I think we have a few other questions in um, in the chat. Um, I think the first one is: um, Do you have some kind of review session to see which nodes need to be created? So this this comes from your Notion um, dashboard, I guess, right? Okay. The question is in part uh, related also to one of the next ones, which is: When do you create nodes, or when do you know? when to create nodes? Do you know ahead of time where you are placing something or do you first write it down maybe on one node and then create it on another? Okay, so I'm not sure I understood the, the first question, but to answer the second one, what I will usually do is I will break up my, uh, my textbook or in general, like my study material uh, in here. So all of these are gonna be things that will probably translate to around one node on my uh, Obsidian. So for example, uh, this is about uh, liver, 
pathology, let's say, uh, physiopathology of the liver. And uh, what I will do is usually just uh, study stuff. And if when I study, I realize that there's a better way to split it, I will simply make another uh, entry here in Notion and split it uh, furthermore. And otherwise, I will just make a note in uh, Obsidian that's called liver physio physiopathology, and then I will talk about it here. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, this is a perfect example. So here, here we have uh, acid-base equilibrium. And as you can see, that's what I made today. Here we have the same exact title. And this is a note I made today that's uh, coming from this thing. That's a note that something, a very specific subject on my, on my thing. I'm going to actually, yeah, close my presentation so I can hop. Oh, actually, close Obsidian. Nice. Oh, no. OK, yeah, my bad. OK, I close the presentation. This way I can hop quickly between Notion and Obsidian. So yeah, that's how I go about creating new notes. And the, this division is usually based on concepts and like subject and division in my in my text, which I usually do before I start studying. So what I will do is I would take my, my big textbook uh, and then I will look through it and decide where when it makes sense to split stuff. Uh, and this is based on two things. First, how long the, the, the chapter or the, the, the paragraph is. So if I, start seeing, if I see that it starts getting too big, I will split it simply because I will need to address it differently in terms of scheduling. And the other reason why I split it is simply because it's a different uh, concept. So uh, usually the, the organization here, so making new notes, will rely heavily on how things are divided over here. Uh, the other things I might do is sometimes uh, things don't make too much sense in here. So sometimes I will make an organization here that's only based on uh, like uh, repetition. Like I, sometimes I might need to split something because it's simply too much pages for me to consider it a single entry. So we'll split it in two. And then here I will just make a, a single page and uh, I will go through it all the way uh, when I repeat. By the way, I think my laptop is dying, so hold on a second, I will just plug it. I will hear you, I'm just gonna go under the table. <laughs> Great, I think uh, I think this answer okay, is- Okay, saved both, it. Uh, at least in my opinion, I think this answers both questions because yeah, the first one was, um, yeah, basically how did you plan your node creation? Uh, and this is linked to your, yeah, basically study plan that you have in Notion. And the other one was um, if you already knew where to place it. And this comes from the, the textbook that you are studying and you already have this uh, in your plan when you created it from the very beginning. Good. Yeah, exactly. It's a mix of like, it's a mix of like commodity and uh, what makes sense in terms of chapter and subjects. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's another question here, uh, and given that you're using multiple nested bolts, do you have one bolt where you do any journaling? And if you do some journaling or do some daily notes in, in Obsidian, uh, how do, 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 do those notes interact with your, for example, medical studying notes? Uh, yeah, I have a personal vault uh, that's completely separated from my university vault. Uh, I don't actually do journaling. Like my journaling is all in here. In a, this is like a physical paper journal. That's where I do my journaling. Uh, and the, uh, on Obsidian, I do have other vaults where I keep most of like my book notes, my video notes, my everything like that. Uh, I keep a lot of our personal stuff in there. Uh, right now, there hasn't been too much overlap between that and my, univer my actual like university and medical notes. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that at one point I will like merge them together. So like, uh, I'm fairly sure that at one point I will just make a bigger vault where I put those two in, uh, and then that's gonna be the vault where I actually do my personal note taking. And then I will gradually zoom in where I have to work on some university stuff. As of now, uh, I haven't seen too much uh, overlap and therefore I didn't really actually merge them yet. Uh, so yeah, that's the reason why I didn't do it yet. And that's the reason why I think I might do it at some point in the future. Great. Um... And then I think we have one more question. Um, if your note is too large and you need to break down, uh, do you do you create a link so that um, yeah the thing you are moving from your current note is linked to the new note that you are making? Yes. Uh, so uh, right now I'm trying to move away from like splitting just because it's too big. Uh, I will try to find a reason for the note to split rather than simply like note too big. And usually what I do, so uh, for the past exam I prepare, what I would 
with simply just, uh, okay, let me open an over just some more material. Okay, let's say this one. What I would usually do is I would simply, uh, hold on. Okay, uh, oops. Okay, I'm sorry. So what I, was, what, I, what I did before, I was simply, let's say I have to, this was too long. Let's say I want to export this part. I will simply do everything here and then use the node refactor and extract section to a new node. And that will leave the first line as a, as a, as the, as the file, it will use the first line as the file name and it will leave here the link. So in the last exam I did this, so I would just uh, highlight everything and throw it away. What, I'm, what I started doing uh, for this exam is that I will try to find ways where it makes more sense to split. Uh, and a good example would be the one, the page I had up open before. So for example, in this case, what I will do is I will have subtitles. And usually what I will try to do is to have some context to what that means, even without having to uh, immediately jump into the link. So like here, I will have just a little bit of information about this thing. And then I will ju actually jump in here and the, 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 the big chunk of information is. But yeah, that, that's how I, I try to split in that way. Uh, but anyways, every time I split something, I will, uh, I will make sure to reference it in the, in the node I originally split it from. Another good example is, the one, is this one here. As you can see here, there are a bunch of links and I will try to write something down and then link to this actually there are way more, there's way more material. Oops. So I hope that was, that was good. Yeah, I, th I think it was. It, it's actually a pretty, yeah, a pretty good way to keep the context in your original notes so that you don't lose the information you originally had there. But then, um, let's say, take the mid to a different, um, yeah, fully fledged note. Yeah, yeah I, I, I also take the the occasion to try to review things. So, like uh, when I do this, I will make the link. Then down here, I will try to write stuff on my own, like to see what I actually remember. The very bare bones thing I can remember uh, on the bigger notes. So yeah, I take every chance as I can to repeat stuff, to recall stuff. I think that's a pretty good practice. Um, okay. Yeah, I didn't see any more questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, it's a good time to to wrap it up. Uh, unless there's someone who wants to ask uh, a question and uh, is not comfortable with the recording, so maybe we're gonna stop the recording and then see Before if anybody has some. Yeah, sure. Yeah, before we do, then uh, I, I just want to say uh, thanks again, Waze, for presenting. Uh, I think this was uh, really, really helpful. It, it definitely brought up some interesting points of discussion from uh, other students, and it already gives an idea also of a very different workflow to what we are used to seeing in, in the Discord. Uh, so thank you very much for, for sharing with us. And um, yeah, uh, small claps, you can use your reactions also to, to thank Waze for the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for listening and for giving me this opportunity. It was really great for me to actually have to work on this. And yeah, thank you so much as well to everybody here and everybody in the community talks. This girl was really, really nice to me. And even though I was like a super noob, everybody was really cool to me. So yeah, thank you very much. All right, then I think we can stop the recording and then get one final um, round 